Uh, wait, and, and, and by the way, I, I, I think well, we have to be very clear. Fragility is not a, a black or white thing. I mean, it's not like yesterday you were not fragile and today you're fragile, uh, right? It's a continuum. And there are different degrees of fragility, which is sort of different degrees of the probability that you might erupt into violence and uh, civil conflict. And yeah, so several countries, several rich countries are uh, have have been moving down that scale. Uh, in fact, in, even in the in the the list uh, that uh, the the World Bank produces, uh, uh, or well, some people at the World Bank produce. I don't think it's part of the official list, but there are people who produce uh, the, these fragility indices as a continuum in terms of the probability of, of uh, uh, eruption to civil war. And the United States has been dropping in that indicator. Um, they don't publicize it uh, <laughs> very widely, but, that's, uh, but I, again, as you said, the people living in the US uh, have already felt it. The other thing that, and this came home to me when I was in the MENA region, I, I seem to sort of <laughs> end up in all these fragile <laughs> situations, but in the MENA region, Think about it. These were not low-income countries. These were middle-income countries. And yet, the other phenomenon in MENA was that it's not just one country or two. It was the whole region was fragile uh, because of the spillover effects. So you had a civil war in Syria, but that created fragility in Lebanon or created uh, uh, problems in Iraq. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have to uh, get out of this idea that fragility is something... Uh, that only affects uh, poor, the very poor countries. It's it's everywhere, including in, in very rich countries. Most definitely, and, and and let's let's stick around there in the MENA for for just a little while longer, because as you were part of the team or led the team, uh, perhaps even producing the WDR twenty eleven, which all was on uh, fragility. I was actually studying Arabic in Damascus, in Syria, right as this was unraveling. And I know we've talked a lot about uh, before how um, even the the most well-informed institutions in the world, such as the World Bank, missed the uh, the signs that, that were all around. And, and I know myself being in Syria, you know, in 2010, I think Syria had, had welcomed more tourists than Australia. And the following year, it went to zero. And the year after that, it was complete civil war. So as we now, you know, celebrate or, or at least mark 10 years since the start of the, the Arab Spring and the publication of the WDR, how has your thinking around fragility and, and conflict changed over this time and specifically informed by those learnings you, you might have taken away from the experience with the Arab Spring? Absolutely. And I think you were right to say that uh, not just the World Bank, but I think the whole international community was caught uh, quite unawares of uh, the, the, Arab, uh, the Arab Spring. And the, the, this comes back to the point about listening to the citizens of the country rather than our perceptions, because the indicators that we observe normally, you know, things like growth and, and poverty and, and even income distribution, were all improving for the whole decade prior to the Arab Spring, for the, during the decade of the 2000s. In fact, the, uh, I remember the IMF had a conference called Tunisia, a model country, in October 2010. Now think about that. That was one month before the guy put himself on fire in Tunisia. Uh, <laughs> right? They didn't invite him to the conference. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, that's the, uh, the, the essence of the disconnect um, that, uh, that we were facing. Um, and so I am, you know, not, not just now, but I mean, o over this period, it, what we realized was, first, we have to listen to the public. Because, you know, there were, there were certainly people, voices in Tunisia, um, in fact, pointing out that this, even this, this decline in inequality was misleading because the way it happened was that it was squeezing the middle class. See, what was happening in Egypt and Tunisia and many of these countries was that the poor were go doing a little bit better, the rich were doing very much better, and the middle class were becoming poorer, 
which meant they were looking more and more like the poor. So inequality was going down in that sense because the middle class and the poor were more equal to each other, but it was going down for a bad reason. So that tells me that there are different ways in which we should be measuring and monitoring economies if we want to really capture what's going on and some of our traditional indicators may actually give us misleading, uh, misleading results. I mean, and and the, the, the best example there is, again, the, the, the MENA region, because while all of these indicators were favorable in, uh, in the 2000s, if, if you look at the happiness indicator that the Gallup poll evaluates, MENA was the unhappiest region in the world. And the happiness indicator was going down in those four countries where the Arab Spring took place. And they were going down fastest. Uh, so we are, we are now trying to monitor that on a regular basis, um, uh, along, along with others. But the other aspect, <laughs> and this is, again, maybe telling a few truths out of school, <laughs> but it's, it's already out there in the public domain. Go so. for it. <laughs> um, the other aspect is that I, I frankly think we did have some of this information uh, even before the Arab Spring. We had done work on cronyism in Tunisia and, and Egypt in the 2000s, but we didn't publish it and we didn't talk about it. Why? Because the governments in power, who were the ones guilty of the uh, uh, state capture, basically threatened the World Bank to say, look, you, you publish this and you're, um, uh, you can kiss your country office goodbye, um, right? Now, the problem is, therefore, when the, the Arab Spring came and these, these dictators were thrown out, and then we did publish these, these results, the public said, why didn't you publish this Five years ago, we knew this was there. You had done the analysis. Why didn't you tell us? And we explain it to them. They then turn around and say, so then why should we believe you now? If that's what guides what you do, <laughs> your credibility is shot. And I, I mean, as I said, this is all in the public domain because there was a case where, you know, the World Bank had a program where we funded uh, NGOs and we funded this really good NGO in Tunisia that did a lot of this transparency work. And when they received the award, they returned it. They said, we don't want to be associated with the World Bank because of its lack of transparency. And we're a transparency organization. Uh, we can't accept the award. So we do a lot of damage in the long term, to us and to the people in the country, by suppressing information. Mm -hmm.